Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Hive series on PCB design with KiCad. My name is Ben, and in this series, we've been walking through the PCB design process using KiCad as our electrical design software. Uh, part five, the th parts five, A, B, and C, uh, are focused on the layout portion of the design process. In our last video, part five, A, uh, we introduced the layout editor and also called the PCB editor. And we uh, discussed how to set up your design constraints and some of your default sizings. In this part, part 5B, I will take you through the basics of placing your components called a process called placement and then a connecting them together place called routing. This video will primarily be focused on showing you the gist and then having you do most of these processes. So definitely follow along and be prepared to pause to spend some time and actually do the work on your own. Let's get started. All right, so now that all that setup is done that we did in the last video, we can actually start laying things out, but where are all of the components? So we need to actually update this view from the schematic. This is a big thing. KiCad doesn't automatically update. You need to actively do updates on your own. So you can go ahead and click F8 or press this little icon here to bring up our update from PCB schematic uh, window. Um, usually it takes a second to kind of generate, especially, and it'll take longer if you haven't, if you have a lot of changes or like a big schematic, something like that. Um, It'll list here all of the changes that are gonna be applied. You can totally read through it if you'd like. I won't uh, scroll through it for your benefit, um, but go ahead and click Update PCB on the lower right whenever you're ready to bring the footprints into the layout view. Well, that's interesting. Fooey, we have some warnings and errors. What are they? Notice at the bottom, total warnings. Uh, like the ERC errors we discovered earlier, errors and warnings in KiCad can be a bit jargon heavy, so let's read these carefully. The warnings say that the battery symbol, BT1, has no nets connected to its pin N, pins N, sorry, pins P and N. The errors say that BT1 footprint does not have a pad 1 or pad 2. This probably didn't help very much. When you assign a footprint to a symbol, KiCad attempts to match the symbol pins and the footprint pads. In this case, the symbol, which we got from a global built-in library, has pins number one and two, which KiCad attempted to match to footprint the footprints pads, which are named P and N. Let's take a quick look at those warnings and errors again. After linking pins one and two with pads P and N, KiCad was then looking at the schematics battery symbol for two pins called P and N because that's what the footprint says they should have been called. Obviously, it didn't find them, and thus there are no nets associated with those pins because those pins don't exist. That's the warning. No nets. Similarly, KiCad went looking for pads 1 and 2 in the footprint because the symbol said that those should exist. Of course, those pads are actually called P and N, so pads 1 and 2 weren't found in the footprint. Hence the error. No pads. Recall way back that I brought up this concern when I said that KiCad not having devices improved flexibility, but you did have to be more careful about pins. And now we know. Symbol pin numbers much must match footprint pad numbers. This can be avoided completely in the future by downloading the symbol along with the footprint and then using that part specific symbol instead. Then they'll be designed to match. However, it turns out this is actually easily resolved in the layout, especially in this case, because there's only two pads. So we're just gonna go ahead and close that update PCB from schematic window and just left click to drop the footprints wherever you'd like. To resolve the pin pad mix up, we need to know what symbols are named, what the symbol pins are named. We actually know this from the last slide, but we can pretend that we don't. So let's head back to the schematic and edit the battery symbol. That is select the battery symbol and hit control E. Go to File, Symbol Properties, as I've shown on the left there, and then check the uh, Show Pin Number option shown in the center here. Click OK to exit out of the Library Symbols property. Remember that KiCad match matches symbol numbers, not names. Names are only for people. Numbers are really what's important here. OK, great. So we see that we've got um, the positive terminal is pin 1 and the negative terminal is pin 2. So we can close this window, saving it's a good idea, and we can go back to the layout editor. Um, now note that the symbol in the schematic will update automatically if you save. So you'll see that one and two there. 
open the properties of the P pad. That is right click the pad specifically and go to properties or left click the pad and hit E. And make sure that you're click clicking the pad specifically, not the symbol itself as a whole, which is easy to do. Um, so we'll renumber this pad number here, uh, this terminal from uh, P to one, renumber it as one and then click OK. If you notice below that, the net name being no net and are a little worried, you don't have to be concerned. We're gonna force an update here in a second. So we can rename this, uh, we're gonna repeat the same thing for pad N, which we'll rename to pad two. And then once you've renamed both of those, go ahead and press F8 to, re to update the schematic layout link again. Excellent, shouldn't see any warnings or errors. Um, we know that things are working because the battery pads are now rat nested. Of course, what's rat nested? The rat's nest is a really important term that refers to all of the connections that still need to be made. It's all of those thin white wires that you see throughout your uh, layout right here. Those thin white lines are actually called air wires and those identify exactly the pad to pad connections that still need to be made. So here comes the first half of the layout process and really it's more than half, but it's called placement. And placement perhaps obviously refers to the uh, placement of all of the components, the actual arrangement of these components. Good placement is really, really important because it will make routing your traces much easier. In fact, much easier and much more obvious. And bad placement can actually make routing basically impossible. An old saying uh, is that PCB design is 90% placement and about 10% routing. And you should consider that in your time allocation as well. So I'm gonna give you some shortcuts here um, and you'll then go ahead and actually start placement, placement on your own. But um, remember that you can move by dragging and clicking or clicking, uh, clicking the, button, the component and selecting M. You can always rotate with R, flip to the other side of the board because remember there are two sides of the board here with F. If your component turns red, it means it's illegally positioned and you can hit control to eliminate the grid snapping. It'll just let you place wherever you want. It may be helpful to hide the fab layers. It's a lot of distracting text in my view. Um, on the right hand side under the layers pane, you get that little I icon next to the f.fab and b.fab layers. Um, one thing you may notice as well while you're doing this to keep in mind is why net names are so useful. I mean, what is the net net-d1-a anyway? Um, I see data sheets often have layout recommendations. These can be really helpful because they're known working arrangements. So you can kind of arrange your components in a similar fashion. Um, again, two screens is very helpful here as, long as well as a, a three button mouse. Um, watch the rat's nest as you move parts around because that'll indicate where things are need to be connected to. And it'll change as you kind of get closer and farther away from stuff as well. Um, but that'll give you a good indication of perhaps how to lay things out. Um, but you do want to conceptualize how your circuit flows together had, and cluster related components into like functional blocks, basically. And then you would move those functional blocks kind of together. Um, in this circuit, it's pretty simple. There's not a lot going on. So there's not a huge amount of functional blocks, but the IC and it's kind of directly associated components, that would be a functional block that you would consider. Really good placement does take time though. There's no need to rush it. Um, this is like a worthwhile place to spend time on. It'll make your layout or your routing much easier um, as well as all kinds of other things. And lastly, as before, your layout will not, likely not look anything like your schematic and that's totally okay. Remember that schematics are for people, but electrons, uh, sorry, layouts are for electrons, not the same goal. So to save you the trouble of finding the data sheet, here is the recommended layout for the RT4526. You'll obviously not be laying the traces out right now, just kind of orienting the components here. I suggest that you pause the video here and take some time to arrange your components. Um, as I mentioned already, placement is most of the work and with good placement will come easier routing. So I would suggest arranging the IC and its auxiliary components here, um, similar to this suggestion, if at all possible. So after you do your own layout, um, I this is my layout, it's very likely not gonna be your layout and that's totally fine. There are many ways to lay out a board, especially simple boards. Simple boards, as long as all the connections are made, the rest probably doesn't matter. Uh, more complex boards, there are gonna be better and worse ways for sure to route things out um, and definitely better and worse ways to lay things out and to place them. Uh, but it's still, it's okay, especially for your first couple of designs to kind of get a sense for that and feel it out. No worries. 
So after we've placed everything and gotten a sense for how big the board needs to be, not a physical sense, but just the area over which our parts um, take up, we want to define the board outline next. So if the board outline was a primary design constraint, you should have done this actually first. Um, like if there was some mechanical const constraint, like it needed to be in an L shape or like a circle or an octagon or something, design that first. Um, that way you can fit your components into the design. In this one, it didn't really matter, so we can do the design, the board outline afterwards. On the right under layers, you can go ahead and select the edge cuts layer to say that we're going to be using this layer next, and then use the drawing tools highlighted there um, to make an outline for your board. You can make your board outline pretty much whatever you want. There's no real limitation to that. I mean, there are some, but generally there's not going to be that many limitations to it. Like the small, the size of like an internal hole sometimes can be limiting, but, and like some curves might be limiting. You might need to have some minimum bend radius, but for the most part, you can pretty much do whatever closed polygon you'd like. Frankly, I made a box. Um, Again, you can be fancy if you want, circles, rounded corners, weird polygons, but a box is totally acceptable and extremely standard. Um, nothing wrong with a box. Um, next, we want to describe, we want to define any large planes, which are also known as polygons or pores. These are large copper areas that are completely fl filled or flooded with copper and can be connected to a net. They don't have to be connected to a net, but they can be. Um, they're widely used for power and ground planes is a very common use case for them. Um, it's safe to think of planes as kind of an arbitrarily arbitrarily shaped traces. Larger traces uh, have lower impedance, so full board planes have the lowest possible impedance of any possible trace. And that's really valuable for ground planes in particular when you want as little voltage drop as possible across your um, board over on the ground. You want everywhere to be as close to zero volts as possible. So to make the ground plane, uh, which should cover the entire layer, a full layer of the board to minimize the impedance, as I mentioned, we're going to um, do this on the bottom plane first. So you're going to select the bottom copper layer on the right first, B.CU. And then you're going to go to the add filled zone icon, which is highlighted here kind of in the middle on the right. Um, you can also open it with the control shift Z. And then you're going to click you're going to click the top left corner of your board outline, which is in yellow. That will start the polygon, and then it will open up the filled uh, zone window, properties window. Fun fact, if you selected a non-copper layer, meaning like F silkscreen, you can actually still make a polygon. It just won't be on copper layer, and it'll be just a polygon of whatever color you, or whatever, um, on whatever layer you selected. So this is the copper zone properties window that I met, mentioned before. Um, you're going to want to make sure that your the layer is correct, layer being the left pane, um, and set the net to ground because we're making a ground plane. Um, on the left under general, left on the in the bottom half of the window are a bunch of settings. On the left hand side under general, we get a zone priority. That'll define the interactions between multiple overlapping zones. And this can be really useful if you have overlapping zones. In our case, it doesn't matter, but something to keep in mind and in the middle under electrical properties we have a clearance option again you you can typically leave that as the default um, but if you're uh, not getting solder mask like if you fab this at the hive you really want to make this bigger rather than smaller because as you're soldering the farther away this plane is from whatever pad you're soldering the less chance there is to accidentally jump the plane to the to the pad um, which would be problematic so click OK when you're done, and then draw the rest of the uh, zone around the board outline. You don't have to click anymore. You just drag, uh, well, you click on your corners, any corner. Um, but otherwise, you just kind of click on the corner and then drag to the next corner, and then click again and drag to the next corner. Great. Uh, once you've kind of closed your polygon, if you zoom in, I didn't show it here, but if you zoom in, you'll see little tiny hatch marks around the edges. That's how you know that it's done or ready to be filled. So press B to fill the zone and redraw the rat's nest. And because it was on the bottom layer, it's in green. If it was on the top layer, it'd be in red. Um, but you might notice that none of the rat's nest disappeared. Um, that's partially because the ground pads of the surface mounted components in the middle aren't actually touching the ground plane yet because they're on the top side and the plane's on the bottom side. Um, 
It's also because I made a mistake when generating this zone when I made these slides, uh, and I set it to no net rather than ground. So the ground pin on the battery should be connected because it's a through hole, but it isn't here. That's okay. I adjusted it later. No worries either way. Next, we're gonna actually start routing. So start by clicking this button here to unfill the zone. It makes it easier to see what you're doing, um, which can be super useful. Next, you're gonna select the top layer of copper because that's where we want our to run our traces since most of our, uh, since all of our surface mounted devices are on the top layer rather than the bottom layer. Um, if they were, you wanted to start on the bottom layer, you could totally do that. Uh, we just, I just don't have any surface mounted components there to do that with. Um, another reason to start on the top is that the um, you want your ground plane to be as unbroken as possible. Um, any breaks or any um, yeah any breaks in the plane actually add significantly to the impedance. I mean it's still small, but add to the add to the impedance and can generate uh, antenna like behavior as well. So you want to be careful with that. Finally, once you've selected your, uh, your the layer you want to start on, go ahead and tap this icon or hit X to begin to enter routing mode. Um, if you hit X, it'll start a route wherever your um, your mouse cursor is. Hitting the route icon will allow you to left click somewhere to start the route. I'm gonna start with the LEDs because they're frankly the simplest. Um, you notice the air wires here are just straight lines so I can just follow those. So uh, once I'm in routing mode, I'm just gonna click without holding one of the pads and then I'm gonna move my mouse to the end of the route and then just click again to end it. I don't need to click and drag, just click once to start, click once to end. You don't need to follow the rats nest exactly, that's definitely sometimes even actively not a good idea. The air wires are just showing what needs to be connected, not how to be connected. It's just the shortest distance between those two pads. Fantastic, so that's one route done. So maybe pause the video and try to route the other LEDs together. That's just two routes here. Great, should look something like this perhaps, or maybe not, it's your design. Um, as an aside, technically the LEDs are running power through them, so they should probably be in the power net class, but it's really not very critical because 10 milliamps is very tiny in PCB design and the, 25, or the 12 mil trace width that I have here is totally acceptable for that kind of current. So next, let's connect a ground terminal to the ground plane of, with a VIA. We, we're going to select one of the capacitors to do this with because bypass capacitors, which is the um, type that connects to a power pin, uh, you always want to correct that, connect that as closely as possible in as short as possible distance to the ground plane, which is almost always just a via. Um, so what we're going to do is you're going to start the route uh, at the ground terminal, just click it, and then you're going to drag the mouse, you're going to move the mouse a little bit away, just a little bit, and then you're going to hit V to generate a via. And then if you move your mouse, you'll actually see the via moves. It doesn't generate necessarily in that spot, just moves. And then wherever you want to put the via, double click to place the via and end the trace. If you wanted to run additional, if you wanted to continue the trace instead of just ending it, you would just single click to place the via and then continue routing, continue your route, but it would just be on the bottom side of the board. Looks like that. So now it's your turn to actually just go ahead and complete the rest of the layout. Um, hopefully it's not too much like drawing the horse over here, uh, but the following slides do have a couple of tips that'll hopefully put you in the right direction. Definitely plan to start with the IC since that arrangement is the most specific and that'll be the most quote unquote difficult to lay out. Um, here's the layout, the recommended layout, um, and I'll have this image up in a, later as well for you to reference. Um, note that the uh, square traces are just an affectation. It's just making the connections. Um, notice that the V out trace is actually via connected underneath V in or over it, depending on how you want to look at that. Um, they have multiple vias here to connect ground to the ground plane. You don't need that because uh, our design really isn't that particular. Uh, that would be technically a little bit better, but for us, it's really not that important. You can always generate a via wherever you want in the schematic, even completely disconnected from a trace by just clicking the V, just clicking V, uh, that, and then placing it with a left click. 
If you run into an error about routing starts or ends violating your DRC, it likely means your trace width is too wide. And you can confirm that uh, seeing the green uh, pads there. That means that I tried clicking on the middle, uh, middle pad and it can't actually fit. It's running into those two pads. The way to avoid this is to adjust the trace width. So you can, the trace width is by default set to the net class default. Remember, because that's a power trace, uh, it's gonna be 25 mils. So we can adjust that through this drop down to the next smallest, which is 16 mils, or you can click uh, W or Shift W as the hotkey to adjust it up or down, and then try the trace again. And I usually try to repeat this until the trace works like fits. Short lengths of thinner than it, than desirable uh, traces are acceptable for the most part, um, as long as they're not too long, whatever that means. Um, and you can always adjust the trace width later through its properties panel as well, so it's not that big of a deal at this second. It's just a matter of placing the trace. You can always adjust it later. Um, you can also press Q while you're routing to bring up a small window to set sizes directly and exactly if you'd like. Um, it's a little more little easier to have those sizes pre-selected and pre-chosen. And don't forget after you make that route to change it back to the net class, otherwise you're gonna have everything being 16 mils and maybe that's okay, maybe it's not, but always a good practice to do so. So I'll leave these up for reference here. Um, press uh, the slash button again uh, with the question mark to flip the traces bend angle if you need. And if you've placed a trace and you need to adjust it, D will drag a trace, which is much better than move because move will actually pick the whole thing up and move it. Drag will only drag the bend of it. Um, so I'd recommend going ahead now and pausing the video and try to route the IC and its components at least, um, which is shown on in my layout on the left there um, and the recommended layout on the right here. So you might take a few minutes. Great, congratulations, routed. It's not the prettiest job ever, but it will work. Um, part of the issue with matching the recommended layout to our, uh, to our parts is that our parts are actually much larger than layout expectation, where they expect, you know, 0201 size components or even 01005 components, like really, really tiny things. So our passives don't really quite fit where the layout is expecting them, which is why it, not only doesn't look the same, but like the traces don't look the same. The other part, part of the other reason for that is that obviously they look like rectangles instead of the symbolic uh, symbols. So that doesn't help. If you haven't routed anything else, uh, maybe the switch or the battery or whatever, uh, now's your opportunity. So I would spend a few minutes doing that as well. You can pause the video. And holy moly. What a process. Everything is routed and placed. Nice work. Uh, so we're pretty close to the end of the tutorial, but if we were to actually designing this, it might be a little bit longer before it was really done due to iterations and DRC checking. Um, you might, you would do again, similar to the schematic, you would um, iteratively design and DRC check and design and DRC check to make sure that things are moving along correctly. One additional thing that I'll talk about here is uh, the need to add silkscreen wherever necessary or desired. Things like orientation info, usage info, uh, sizings, pin functions, and more are valuable ads um, or your you know, personal logo. Um, but definitely the designer's signature uh, is a really good addition to have on any board that's yours. Uh, your name and the project name in silkscreen to identify the board, probably the revision also is really valuable when you're looking at a board and trying to figure out what was going on with it. Um, you can do that with the text icon. Uh, or adding text onto the silk screen. It's a text icon there or control shift T. Bring up the text properties window. Um, type in whatever you'd like here, identifying information, make sure to select the correct layer. Adjust the font, si font and size if you'd like to. Um, again, that printed uh, copy of the sizings can be really valuable here. Um, knockout means that the text polygons are actually subtracted from a layer on the text. Um, this can be really useful for a variety of reasons, but it's just an option that you have there. And if you're going to place the text on the back side of the board, you'll want to mirror the text. Um, if you just put it on the back side, it'll read correctly when you're looking at it on the design, but then when you get it printed and you flip the board over, it'll actually be mirrored. So it's important to mirror it first. Great, so I put mine in the lower right there, um, nice and easy. 
And with that, we get to the end of part 5B of our PCB design with KiCad series and a nearly completed layout. All that's left is to check the mechanical dimensions of the various components, do the DRC, and plot the Gerbers. And we'll talk about all that and a little bit more in part 5C next. Uh, a PDF of this video as, uh, is available as well, as always, and that's going to be linked in the description below or hosted on the Hive's wiki. We will see you for part 5C later.